Hey everybody, I am Tim Burnett and this is the Solo Hunter Podcast. We're all about hunting good, eating good, and downright rugged individualism. I'm talking hunting and adventure, business and life with other self-sufficient, like-minded individuals. This is podcast episode number eight. You gotta have a story. No, forget the story. Everybody's doing something. We'll do nothing. They say, what's your show about? I say nothing. There you go. It's about nothing. I think you may have something here. All right, in this podcast, it was actually a conversation that Remy and I were having in an earlier podcast, but we went so long that we decided to break this up into three different segments. We start out talking about Onyx maps and, and Google Earth and using topo maps versus satellite imagery in your scouting and, and just looking and researching for new hunting areas and then also using that information that you gather for years, year after year, taking, taking information that you learned five years ago or, or whenever and incorporating that into your hunting strategy for, for now. We also discussed, um, you know, the, the bait debate. I just spent some time in Utah hunting for, for mule deer there. And somehow we got into the debate or the conversation of, you know, bait versus no bait. We talk a little bit about hunters versus hunters and doing no harm to the sport that you love. Um, we're all public ambassadors, you know, one of the points that Remy pointed out here was whether you like it or not, we are all public figures. If you're making posts publicly, you're you're in the public's eye. Um, and then we we kind of finish things up talking about hunters becoming the anti-hunters, and really how you know it's it's our stewardship and our responsibility to represent the sport or represent hunting um, in a way that can be not only acceptable to to us as hunters, but also acceptable to those as non-hunters who seem to be the majority in this world. Um, so anyway, it was a great conversation that we had, uh, continuing on from the, the last podcast that we did. And then the next podcast that we post will be a continuation of what we discussed here. So hope you enjoy this time that I had with, with Remy. It's always a good time to sit and chat with the guy. Oh, we go. Sorry. Yeah, I hit it. I hit record. Part of in, in working with them and developing the new app that they just launched about a month or so ago, we wanted to produce a hunt and episode to kind of showcase the new features. And it was myself and several other of the, the people that work with Onyx Maps that, are, that did that. So I knew going into it that this hunt was going to be filmed specifically for that. And so that's how I set it all up. I mean, so I documented, and usually when I go into a new area somewhere that I've never hunted before, and I had drawn this tag, I think three years ago, I drew the tag and never even went because I just didn't have time. Um, I think I still had a Nevada tag at this at the time. But I always, in, in the research, the first thing I do is I gather intel from people that know or get information from friends or people around there that have hunted that area, that know anything about it. And so Riley, since he put me in for that area um, to begin with, of course, I'm going to hit him up. You know, where's yeah. where's some of the traditional hides and all that without without getting like real personal and real detailed information. So I gain like a lot of intel that way. And then I jump into Google Earth and Onyx and start just charting and marking waypoints and just looking at the area. I mean, you can learn a lot just from looking straight down on, oh, on the, yeah. t the area. And I, I particularly like, um, it's one thing, I don't think Google Earth has it in there where you see the topo. I think it's just a straight satellite imagery yeah. of over the top. And then what Onyx had, has done is they overlay the topo on top of that. And then, of course, the public land, private land ownerships boundaries over the top of that. So you can really dial in access points, camping spots, um, get a better idea of the topography. And a lot of times what you don't see on just an aerial, you don't see a lot of those benches and stuff where those bucks might be bedding in some of the tall sagebrush. And yeah. that's that's kind of what I found is some of the spots, it's, it's funny – I marked a few waypoints on the map and then in talking to Riley, he's like, well, I would go check out here. I'm like, oh, I've already marked that, you know? So that kind of reiterated to me that that was a good spot to be. And then I actually two or three different times got on bucks right on some of those benches that I found because of the, the topography or the topo maps layered over the top of it. So yeah, that's, that's tool. huge to me. And I try, I, I talk about it all the time, but it's really hard for me to exactly explain what I'm looking for. But I, I'm not joking. I, I can look at a topo map. Well, last year, I looked at a, a topo map. I didn't really talk to anyone about the unit I had for mule deer or anything, just looking at the topo lines 
and and then the overlays and going, okay, I picked three spots that I wanted to go check out. Those three spots just so happened to hold the three biggest bucks in the unit right. where guides and outfitters had hundreds of trail cameras and hundreds of hours. Yeah. And it, I found all three of those bucks from my house just based on the topography of areas that I looked. People, people probably thought, oh, yeah, someone told them where this buck was. No, I just looked at things that I was interested in and then the topography and said, this is a good spot to hold deer. Go there and just, you know, got lucky and spotted the buck while I was there. Yeah, and I think a lot of that comes from experience, too. You're looking for areas on the map that are areas where you've seen Correct. big bucks or bucks or anything before. I, I use the word big bucks. For me, it's just bucks. Like, I'm a buck hunter. I like right. to hunt deer. Um, I'm now slowly transitioning into I'm looking for an upper-class deer, and that's kind of what I was looking for on this hunt. But you just kind of log those mem- those in your memory of what type of terrain that I've seen these in, and that's what I look for on the maps, you know. Stuff yeah, like that, but it and it and there is a. I think we could probably highlight a few things that I I look for, um, as far as the way the hill is oriented, and I look for anything that I call a pocket or a bull. A lot of times, if I've never been in an area, I always start for those pockets and bulls. That thing that makes and usually a pretty shape, high, pretty usually high. They're high. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're mid mountain. And then you you use the topography to find it. I always go topography, then imagery, because I look at the topography and go, okay, this is the suitable topography, and then let's see if it's covered in trees or if it's open, if it has what I'm looking for, because depending on the animal is going to depend. You're saying, you know, mule deer. Even the time of year, a mule deer in the velvet is going to be more open than a mule deer hard horn. Exactly. Yeah, like I'm actually, the article that I'm writing this afternoon is about using topography in the timber Mm. to hunt elk. Because if you think about it, most places you hunt and you can't see, you have no clue what the ground really looks like. Right. But you can pull out that topo map and say, okay, here's the topography that works in areas that are open. And then I find elk that way in places you can't see. How do you know where to go in the timber? You well, look, you, yeah. Oh, sorry. I oh, remember. no, I, that's it. I was going to say, you look at the map and from the top, it just looks like a timber draw. But you, if you click on that topo, next thing you know, you're like, dang, there's got to be a spring or a wallow in there, and there's a bench in there. Exactly. And those elk love those benches in that dark, dark That's timber. That's exactly They don't want to bed on a, on a side hill. They want to be kind of flat, you know? Yeah, and the other thing is you could have – I could go in – I, I know you do it as well. You go into an area you've never been, and you go, ah, shit, it's real timbered, but that's where the wallows that they're going to be using are. Mm-hmm. How does a guy that's never – Wallows aren't marked on maps, right. but you can use those to, that topography to figure out, okay, there's a creek down here that's flowing. There's stuff that feeds into it, but there's these benches, and that water just settles in those benches. Mm-hmm. I mean, I found wallows on the middle of a hill where it just came down straight and then flattens out like this, and it's like, sure enough, because there was a stream below, mm-hmm. there's a wallow right there, and then I've killed a lot of elk in that wallow. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm generally not looking for wallows as much as I am just bedding. You know, yeah. thick bedding, and that's that's where a lot of those benches, and then a lot of times on a ridge, if you've got a spine of a ridge coming down and it just swoops just a little bit, and if it's covered in timber and stuff, there's a good chance that there's going to be some bedding up there. And usually the bulls like to bed in there. Yeah. And um, in some of the places where I hunt, it's just traditional. You go in there, and there's just trees just shredded. I mean, they're shredded all the pieces, and then there's beds. And you go in there during the hunting season, and that's where the bulls are hanging out, you know. Um, until they herd up with the cows and then things, things go change. all crazy. You know, once the bulls start really cruising and chasing, that all changes. So elk hunting is a lot, I mean, it's it's a lot different than than early season deer or anything else. But yeah. the, the key, I think, what we're, what we're trying to get to is, is using those to- the topo and just the topography lines more so than just the imagery. You yeah. Know, the imagery just isn't going to cut it as much. Yeah, and I think if you find – the cool thing with like I, I've been using it as well, the, just the app because I can I'll download the hybrid map, so I'll do the the topo and then the imagery, and and switch back and forth. But if I while I'm out there, if I see a spot, okay, there's a lot of deer over there. I'll mark it, yep, and then switch to the topo and see what it looks like. Yeah, and you'll go okay. Like if if you're tr- just trying to figure out how to use the topo and don't really understand. Go out in the field, look at stuff that you see animals in market, and then look at the way those lines are orientated. Look at, start 
making a list of things that are the same. And then when you go to an area you've never been to, you can use all that information. Yeah. Cause I use it as more of a, a journal tool, a logging tool too. When I'm out there, if I see, like I say, if I see a big deer somewhere, I'm going to mark it. If I see a wall or somewhere, you're going to mark it. So you can gather all this information. Cause as much as you'd like to try to remember everything you can't, and yeah. especially like, even something simple. You're seeing lots of does here. Okay, I don't really don't want to focus on this area. Maybe the bucks are going to be somewhere else. In talking with Riley, I'm probably going to put in for this area again. You know, um, it was awesome. It was my kind of country, high high desert, big mountain. Plus, you had a lot of thick stuff. So now I've got all the information that I gathered over the two weeks of hunting it this year that I can carry over into next year if I draw the tag again. And it's just a general hunt. It's nothing special. But um, if I have it again, I don't have to go in there and start from scratch. Yeah. You know? I can go in there and be like, all right, I know exactly where I'm going to head first and then kind of make a plan from there. So Yeah, that makes a big difference. Did um, So did you go up there twice or just, just the one time? I went twice. So I always come home on the weekends regardless of how far I am. That's kind of my commitment to my family. I try to be home for baseball on Friday nights and uh, or football or whatever it is. This right now, it just happens to be Hudson's in baseball and football. So – it's pretty busy when I get home Friday and Saturday and then head back on the road Sunday afternoon or Monday morning. So, cool. Yeah. So I came back in between, but okay. I hunted two, two weeks out there. Two weeks. So, wow. Which is good. It was it kind of – like I know, I know that's the commitment that I made, but I found that on Thursday afternoon and Friday, like I was in it. I mean, I found the bucks that I wanted or close to the bucks that I wanted, but I felt like I was, I was dialed. And – um I hate, kind of hated to leave, but I left anyway. When I went back Monday, it was like starting over. Oh, yeah. It wasn't until the following – it wasn't until Thursday that I even saw another buck again because huh. of the weekend hunting pressure that came in. Um, in that area, there's a bunch of boss sheep and cattle, and so they're going to push those deer around. And yeah. it wasn't just boss sheep. They were all the rams. Oh, so yeah. it's where they where, – where the local rancher or whatever you want to call a sheep, a sheep farmer. Is that a rancher? Shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> Shepherd. But it's where they were keeping all the rams. And I grew up on a farm. I know what rams are like. They're, they're some aggressive suckers. Man. Yeah. And they're going to – I could I could picture a ram just going in and pushing a buck right out of his bed. No oh, problem. for sure. I mean, all of the buck hides and buck beds that I found up in there were just loaded with sheep crap and that. And so you could tell that the sheep were real aggressive. But I, I was, it was just like starting over, you know, and so I kind of, I kind of burned myself a couple of, couple of days by, by coming back. But that's just the way it is, you know. So. Hmm. No, it's I, the other thing though is you could have stayed out there, and then you get that weekend pressure, and all that stuff would have happened anyways, and you just get more frustrated yeah. and go, and then you commit to an area because you're there. Yeah. Do, do you ever do that where you get into an area and then you've been there for five days and then everything goes wrong there because of something like that? Yeah. But because you were there, you don't leave. But if you leave, then you show up and you're like, ah, well, I'll go somewhere else. I'm really bad at that. Like I, I get committed to an area, but um, that's a big no-no, especially here in Nevada. And, and Utah is very similar. Like you got to stay mobile. If you, I think, I feel like if you invest into an area, whether you backpack into it or whether in this case I was just tr camping out of my truck, um, you really limit yourself and handicap yourself on what, what other oh, country yeah. is out there. But I had it so ingrained in my head. Riley said, this is where I needed to be. I saw the bucks early on. This is where I needed to be. Um, there was a part of the mountain that I had to hike into that there was no, no four wheeler roads, no mining roads. Like it was, it was a lot of work to get in there. Um, one stock that I did, I marked it on the GPS before I dropped down in there. And it was 1800 feet drop, wow. you know, from the top down into where these bucks were. And I sat there. I, I think I, by the time I got down in there, it was like two o'clock cause I took my time, just really wanted to stay in the shadows and, and, uh, work in there. Got there about two o'clock. I sat there till the sun, the sun set. And I'm just thinking anytime these bucks are going to stand up. Because I, I watched them from straight up above. I watched them bed down in this tall sagebrush. Yeah. And I knew it was tall sagebrush because when I was watching them, they would be walking and then they just disappear. So I knew the sagebrush was over their heads. Yeah. You know? But I'm like, they're right there. All I got to do is get. And I got to within 40 yards, nice and hunkered down. A huge lightning and thunderstorm rolled through and just beat the crap out of me with rain. And I'm like filming it with my phone just whatever I can do and the sun sets and I'm like, Hmm, they ought to be getting up anytime. You'd think, you know, there was a doe with them. So maybe she would have got up and farted around and 
Finally, I kind of lost patience, and I flung a flung a stick out there, nothing. And so I just started tossing crap all over out there where they were, nothing. Really? So then I just bushwhacked back and forth through, because by then I'm pissed, you know. By then I'm like, I just burned the whole day, and I got to go back up. Yeah. Because camp's up there, or my whatever's up there, I got to go up over and then back down to my quad. And I'm just ticked. So I just brush beat back through there, and I think, oh, maybe I can jump shoot one or something. And the sagebrush is over my head, so there was just no way. And I couldn't find them. So the only thing I can think of was it looked like they bedded, and they just walked somewhere else. Yeah. Or in the meantime, when I dropped back behind, they got they up moved. and moved away. So. Yeah, that's tough. That that tall sage, too, can be the easiest way to get close to deer, but the hardest way to shoot one. <laughs> yeah. Because true. you get in there, they stand up, and all you see is their head, and you go, oh, well, I'm 12 <laughs> yards away, but I have no shot. Well, I was, like, positioned perfect because I could see down into it. I was quite a bit higher from where they were bedded, and I could see down into it, and I'm, like, 45, between 40 and 60 yards. I'm like, wow. money. And, I mean, I glassed all afternoon, and I could not pick out one one thing. And the whole time I'm thinking they're not there, but – the hope kept saying they're there. Yeah. And so I, I burned a whole day, you know, on that one stock and got nothing out of it but rained on. And that's the hard part about when you're there by yourself. You go in and you have to always assume that they're there and you always assume that they leave. Yeah. You have to assume both. <laughs> you, but you cannot just well, assume that they're gone because that's how you generally blow it. I guarantee if you were up there spotting for me, you would have made me sit there all the afternoon too, and you would have you would have been like, "Huh, they left, but yeah, and let's see if he figures it out." And exactly. you would have got off and left. yeah, exactly. <laughs> My brother, he might have told me. He, he might have tried to flag flag me down. you down, let yeah. you know where they went. Yeah, but it it was a good hunt. You know, I learned a lot from from doing it. I got a lot of good good film on that, but it was tough too. I just never saw the caliber of buck that I really wanted. I mean, there was a couple that I would have settled for, but it would have been just that, just settling. You know, just yeah, just. Just didn't didn't work out. And I think I've got two or three days left to the season now, but I'm crunching out a bunch of work so I can head to Idaho on my elk hunt. So. Cool. Yeah, the one thing I always think is strange about Utah, even general area tags, maybe you want to talk about it, maybe you don't. But And it, I didn't really realize it until recently, how much baiting and – I didn't even know that that was legal there. And a lot of these big deer you see are just baited in, aren't? or, or is that – I got to be careful here. Well, I say I got to be careful. But there's no I mean, it like it, like that's it's that's the way it's done. It's legal there. Some some of these big deer are probably killed over bait, some of them probably not. You know, you just don't know. But I was just looking for a deer that wasn't cross-eyed and cranked out on critter crack. <laughs> I just wanted a deer that was not laced on something. Um and between between bait and trail cameras, like that's the thing. That's that's it's really popular in Utah. For some reason. Yeah, and I, I, didn't, I guess maybe I just didn't realize it because you're so ingrained that that's illegal every, or not everywhere, but where I hunt. Yeah. I mean, it's extremely illegal in Montana and Nevada and Idaho. Right. I mean. From what I understand, it's, it's always been that way. Like, it's always been legal. It's not something new. I just think, um, and you and I have been in the industry for a long time, you know. I just, I never saw it. I never, I never knew until probably two or three years ago that that was, that was the way things were going on. I mean, you can see trail cameras and you just think, ah, they got it on a, a natural lick or a water hole or, you know, maybe an apple orchard or something. Um, you know, I guess to preface this whole thing, most of the big, big deer that you see get killed, um, by TV people, that's all private property. Those are private ranches. They're, they're still wild deer, but that's limited access. You're, you're paying for that buck basically. Yeah. In my opinion, sorry to, if anybody gets offended with that, but that's really kind of, you still have to hunt it and kill it, but, um, it's different than hunting a, a, a public land area and somewhere that's a lot more pressured, but yeah, I didn't see in this area, um, I'm sure there was probably some, some of that going on somewhere, but really I only ran into one guy one day really? because I hunt during the week and he was, he was acting like he was probably going to a blind or a, a specific place because he went in, was there all day and then came right back out. And, and I had, had been in part of that area and it looked like there might've been somebody hunting down by a little pond type of an area, but I didn't, I didn't see it. Um, but it's, that's, that's Utah. 
And you just look at Instagram. That's Utah, man. Yeah, and I, I mean, I don't. I'm not saying it's good or bad or what. Yeah, I, I really right. don't care. Like, if it's illegal and that's the way you want to hunt, I, I don't care how people hunt. I mean, I'm just yeah. glad that people are out hunting, and as long as they're following the law. But um, I just didn't realize. I don't know. Maybe. And and I guess I can't knock it till I try it. I'd <laughs> be probably work pretty good. But it's a hard thing to I talk about. It, yeah, really? I wonder because if I, it, it even, makes me uncomfortable. On some deer, it may not even make a difference. On some of the really big right. bucks, I don't think that it. They may just be the type that if they do use it, it's at night. But you know they're in this area. Right. I don't know. Um, I think it's used as a tool a lot. Like it's it's used because if you've ever hunted Utah, there's some pretty wooly places. You know, I mean, it gets thick. Even in places where you look at the mountain and you think, oh, I can just bebop up this ridge and glass down in this timber or whatever. Like the ridge might have six feet tall of brush on it. You know, I yeah. mean, it's it's thick. It's the only thing I can liken it to is kind of like Texas, maybe where if you don't bait, you're not going to see them. Um, and that, and the people that I know use it as a, as a tool to find a target animal, a target buck or a target bull to go after. And that, that's where it's, that's where it comes in handy. I mean, that's where it's great. Whether they're hunting over it or not, I don't know. It doesn't really matter because it's yeah. legal. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, but those are two things that I don't, that I don't use and pretty much have never used is trail cameras and bait. You know, I mean, I use a trail camera here and there, but. Just it's just not anything that I've ever gotten used to because, like you said, growing up in Idaho and Montana, and you can't even use time, it. you can't even use trail cameras in Montana. Not even a conversation to have, yeah. you know. And so it's really new and foreign when you go to places where you can use it. It's like I could use it, but I don't know how for yeah. one, you know, or I or the, the time know. that it takes. Right. Um, I think it's different when you're traveling too for hunts when it's a destination hunt. Yeah. You don't have time to drive out there 10 hours and plant a bunch of cameras and bait stations and then come back and then go out there and hope that they're still there. I mean, that goes on a bunch, a lot of stolen cameras and whatever else. Uh, Riley yeah. had a couple of them stolen while I was there. And, really? And I was in the bow shop and he got on the phone with this guy and he just pretty much let him have it, you know? So. Hmm. See, one of the things that I th- think about, well, and it just opens up an interesting conversation because – Okay, we talk about bait, and then it comes back to, well, we don't do it. But one of the things that I don't like to do is be a hunter that says, I don't like this hunt. Be a hunter against hunters. Right. But on the other hand, as hunters, there are things that might bring into question people from people that don't hunt the ethics mm-hmm. involved. Now, whether baiting or salt or whatever is one of those questions about ethics. I don't know, but there's things that are above the law that go into this code of ethics that as hunters, we have to be really cognizant of because we are not the ones that decide whether hunting Mm -hmm. continues or not. I think one of the, one of the things just from my view, you look at things that hunters do the best anti hunter can sometimes be a hunter. Be a hunter yeah. in, in my opinion, the word anti-hunter means anybody that harms the sport of hunting. So, you know, back in the day, we created organizations like the Boone and Crockett Club that started putting animals back on the mountain, started, you know, conservation organizations, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Wild Sheep, other things. And every single one of these organizations has a code of ethics. And in, the, uh, I would say, a general point in a code of ethics is to do no harm to the sport that you love. Right. Whether it's be, that says nothing about a law legal or not. that says nothing about anything, but do no harm to hunting. Well, how do you do that? You, you can promote it in a healthy way and you can promote it in a way that does harm. And one of the things that, I mean, I'm not afraid to talk about because it's, it's important to me as hunters. We, I, I think that everybody listening should do a serious fact, like a serious internal check on what they're doing and say, is this hurting hunting? Is Are my actions hurting hunting to the non-hunting decision makers? Hunting is not a right. It's a privilege. Mm-hmm. And it'll, it'll remain a privilege until the people that make decisions take that privilege away. Right. And then you're going to wake up one day and go, how, well, how did that happen? Well, is the actions that you did that <laughs> caused it? Because with social media, there's a large group of people that don't hunt. And if you show them all you, you don't show them what hunting really means and what hunting really is. It's about being in the outdoors. It's about respecting the animal. It's about providing food for your family. Then you're gonna, you're gonna 
cause some negative reactions. Yeah, and and even even if you, the hard thing I have is, is say a, say a graphic image or something. You know, for for me, even a bloody arrow or a bloody broadhead or something like that, I don't see that as value. Um, as a hunter, as somebody that purchases product, as somebody that hunts and, and spends a lot of time in the outdoors, there are a lot of things that I see that I don't see as value to me. And if we're not, if, if the content we're putting out there isn't for other hunters, who's it for? You know, if we're not trying to influence, whether it's an advertiser or friends or people within the hunting community, who are we, who are we trying to get with that photo? You know, I mean, am I trying to, to post a photo and have Remy Warren say that? Ah, that's awesome. That's badass. I'm going to like that. Or are we posting that photo for the shock effect where it's like, you know, I'm holding the heart in my hand. That's another one I have issues with personally. You know, it's like you're showing depending, you know, if it's cleaned up and, and preparing for to eat or whatever else, that's, that's different. But when it's like just the bloody heart, blo- like I personally take issue to that because, I'm a hunter and I don't like it. Some other hunters love it. I'm sure it's great, but I'm not the only one looking at this media or consuming yeah. this media. I'm only 2% of the voting class or whatever it is as a hunter, 2, 3%, whatever the, whatever the voting percentage is, we're super small. It's those that come across it when they're in their search and they're a fan of cutie, cuddly bear hearts. And that's what the hashtag that they, they, typed in and all of a sudden they have these bloody deer hearts in people's hands they're going to automatically assume that deer hunters are all a bunch of jerks you know yeah well that that is kind of one of the things that i was just thinking about is when hunters become the anti-hunter it's because they are showing hunting in a poor image to other people and how does that i think the smartest anti-hunting organizations just use hunters to end hunting That's with the it. whole P did you see that PETA um, Facebook thing? It was like, I take selfies, yeah. not yeah. shoot selfies, not animals. Yeah. I had no idea what that was for so, until I read into it here. I was just reading a news article the other day. And when I first saw that, I said, this is going to be really bad for hunters because they essentially trolled, hijacked their thing and started taking horrible pictures of dead animals they did exactly what PETA that's wanted. exactly what PETA wanted are you yeah. are we that stupid to think like oh we're really hurting PETA PETA is as an if I'm an anti-hunter I know that the best way to get hunting banned is for one of these people that hunts to show it in such a poor light that people that don't yeah. hunt take offense and join the other side yeah they had the highest like growth they've ever had because people that didn't hunt started seeing horrible pictures from hunters and said, "Ah, oh, shit, they're right. Yeah. Can you imagine the meeting, the PR meeting for PETA when the guy walked in and had the idea that said, Hey, I got an idea that we're going to do. It's a PR program. We're going to launch this and I'm going to get thousands of hunters to post pictures of dead animals and use our, use our, our thing. I'm like, and we're going to get them to do it. And they're like, well, how are you going to get other hunters to bash themselves? Well, it's easy. This is how it's going to be. That's exactly what it was. Is it was everybody took a look at it and thought, well, I'm going to throw this in PETA's face. You just provided thousands and thousands of posts and content for their PR stunt, for their PR. Yeah, you were a, you're program. a pawn. You are an, everyone that posted yeah. a picture of that. I'm sorry. I'm probably going to. You didn't even people, get paid for but it. <laughs> you became. An, you helped an anti-hunting organization. Inadvertently. But, inadvertently. They, non-intentionally. But that was, that was their, I mean, it, to me, when I saw that, I said they did that on purpose. They had to have done it on purpose. They're not dumb. They're no, not dumb. I, I mean, it, it made so much sense because you think really somebody that doesn't hunt would, I, I mean, obviously, it, and it worked in their favor. And because of it, hunting suffered. Right. Because people had to go, oh, well, I'll show them. They're on the other side. You know what the best way to show them is? Post something that's thoughtful and inspires someone who doesn't hunt to say, that makes sense. Yeah. I agree with hunting. Yeah. It's about conservation. It's about adventure. It's about uh, respect to the animal. It's about uh, feeding my family. It's about these things. And and get people to go, yeah, you know, PETA, nah, that doesn't... Because really, if you look at what PETA stands for, it's so far out there. Most people cannot sign on with that. Right. I mean, I I remember 
when I first started looking into the organization just for research, the, the origin one of the original founders, I think her name was Ingrid something, her philosophy was, I'd rather there be a void space in this world than me exist. And people just can't sign on to that. Yeah, no. It's- a lot of people enjoy eating meat. They enjoy, but they don't like cruelty to animals. That's just a standard. None of us hum- like no one likes that. A hunter does not is not cruel to the animals. Right. In order to eat meat, an animal must die, and we do it in a respectful way. And if we show the process. Hunting to the normal brain makes sense. Right. But if you show it in this way that is not that, then it it pushes people over to this other side. Yeah. I I try to and, and I'm I'm gonna I'm not gonna say that all the stuff that I post or that I do is totally totally above board and doesn't drum up some controversy at some times, maybe. It's never an intention, but uh, that that could happen. But I think if if I sit back and I look at it and I say by me making this post, what are my intentions here? Are my intentions to show and, and document my journey, my adventure, whatever whatever I'm on? Or is my intention here to shock somebody or to um, appeal to an audience to boost my social media profile? If, if it has anything to do with boosting my social media profile outside of the desire to, to provide good, authentic, solo content and to share my life with people, then I'm not going to post it. I'm like, I'm not even going to think about it because the trade-off is not worth it. I, I have this conversation with my brand manager, Joel, all the time where he's like, we're sharing ideas of what we're seeing some of these other marketers do and different brands and different things. And we have these conversations. Well, what can we do to incorporate into the promotion of Solo Hunter, the promotion of our podcast, whatever, all those things. And my number one thing is, is, is I would rather have fewer people in my audience that like what I do than to have, and, and to keep everything above board than to have more people like what I do, but have a percentage of those think that I'm an idiot. Well, well, I shouldn't use the word idiot because most of them probably think I'm an idiot anyway, but to actually have disdain or hate or distaste towards what I'm doing, because yeah. a lot of what, what people do, like I even, even myself, I look at some things and I'm like, I do not like that. I despise that. But, I like some of this other stuff that they're doing, but I, I would rather have fewer people talking good about me than more people talking good and, and have that negativity thrown in there. I yeah. Guess. And, and the other thing is I think people might confuse like, Oh, you don't stand up for hunting or you, Oh, you're just going to back down. That has absolutely nothing to do with it. That's such a narrow minded view that that's, what's going to get hunting ended. Yeah. I am in it for the long haul, for the longevity of what I love and that I know that it is, is a good thing that can be promoted and can be sustained and should be around. And there's ways to do it and there's ways not to do it. And as a collective group, we need to self-police and be a hell of a lot smarter than we are right now. If you see something that's like, yeah, maybe, I mean, yeah, okay, there's certain things that, okay, well, it might offend some people. That's not it. It's not about offending and not offending. It's about what you're portraying to the people who are going to make the decisions. I'm not talking about anti-hunters. I'm talking about the general public. So as a, as a collective, as a group that enjoys hunting, we need to be together on things and say, okay, well, maybe that doesn't look so good if you're making something public. Whatever you do outside of public, you know, whatever. That's, yeah. But we're talking about things that are public because now everyone can publish whatever they want. Everybody's a public want. figure at some level now yeah. with it, with the social media. You just have to accept that. So everybody is an ambassador for this. You won't. Everybody's job should they should look at everything they do if they're a hunter and putting anything out to the public on any social media or YouTube or anything. Say, I'm an ambassador for the sport of hunting. What am I showing to people who don't hunt as a representation of what I do? And if it doesn't follow those lines, then as hunters, we need to check each other and say, hey, I don't think that this follows the guidelines as in a good way of putting out what we're doing to people that are making the decisions. Yeah. I've, I've, I've called, not called out, but I've talked to a, a few different times where I felt like it's, where I felt like somebody needed to step in. And it wasn't a perfect stranger. It was people that I knew or had had, had communications with. And so it was received very well where it was like, oh, I didn't really think of it that way. But I just sent a nice, calm little message. I said, hey, appreciate you tagging me in this. Um, I love what you do. This picture might might be a little bit graphic for our audience, just in my opinion. 
Um, if you want to talk about it further, here's my phone number, whatever. And every time those guys came back and said, you know, I didn't, didn't really think of it that way. And it went over really, really well. Uh, gr- granted, probably one of these times I'm going to say that they're going to be like, get off your high horse guy. You know I mean? Yeah. Who do you think you are? Well, I've kind of been around for a, quite a while, you know, and I've seen a lot of things. I've seen the industry change in the last 15 years, and it's changing more rapidly in the last two or three years than it has the first 10, you know. Yeah, and that's um, the scary part is because it can grow, it can grow real fast, and it can die real fast yeah. in this world today. It's a completely different world than when we were growing up. Yep. When I was growing up, the only thing you ever saw of hunting was a magazine at a store where you bought it. Or from your friends. Or you buy a, or you you buy a DVD. Video. Yep. Nothing was open air. Nothing no. was to the public. You had to actually go out and purchase that. Right. But there was also not the ability to show people why hunting is so beneficial. Right. So you can see these huge curves of growth and drop and growth and drop. And it all depends on the people that hunt mm-hmm. and how they're portraying what they're doing out into the world. I've got an idea. What if everybody out there that is, uh, as you, uh, how'd you put it at, we are all ambassadors to the sport of hunting. Yeah. What if we all made our post directed towards the ambassadors of the sport of hunting a lot more and a lot less about being ambassadors about the products that we're using, you know, or the products that we're trying to use or the the sponsors that we're trying to get. Exactly. Make it more about what we all want, you know, and what we all can achieve, the hunting and and the lifestyle part of it. Yeah. Less about the... And I think that that's, Whatever. it's a very, it's a very important thing. And I feel like I try to do that because that's, well, it's just what I care about. Yeah. And I know that you do it a lot as well is we talk, I'm not just talking to the person that hunts. I'm talking to the person that doesn't hunt. I'm talking to the person that might just, because I've made it public, it needs to be under certain, and obviously there's a lot of hunting stuff on there. It's all hunting. That's all I do. Mm-hmm. I'm not sugarcoating it. I'm not politically correcting it. I'm just putting out what hunting is in a way that promotes hunting itself. And you're probably more of a target than a lot of us are because you are, you run in so many different circles and a lot of those are prominent circles. So there's a lot more people talking about what you are doing than what I'm doing or other people are doing. So you're out there quite a bit more. So if, if you, I mean, like to me, it makes it, me feel like you have to watch that even a little bit more closely because you are out there and you know that people are talking about you. So you want to make sure that it's all in a good light and not in, Oh, Hey, did you see what Remy did? You know, or Remy said this or whatever. Um, I just feel like we're, we're in a little bit more of a spotlight, I suppose. So it's, it's a lot more pressure to make sure that, that we're doing it right. Um, yeah, but yeah, I don't know. I, yeah. I, we started out on one thing, but I think that that's important <laughs> to talk about. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of going to be my push for the next forever, probably, because the world that we're in now and the way that I just see things going in such a – things going bad so fast for hunting when we have tried so hard to – when we when we actually – to the normal, rational person, it makes sense. Well, we've got all the assets there to make it go so right so fast. Correct. We're just using, we're just, maybe we're not doing it right. Yeah. You know? And maybe that thing just, you know, fired me up. I'm like, you've got <laughs> to be kidding me. You guys are just giving PETA exactly what they want. Yeah. And I'm sorry, you know, but I'll, there's a lot of I have friends a lot of, of friends mine who posted that it, did it. Yeah. And like, they were thinking, oh, epic backfire on their part. And my thought is like, no, this is yeah. an epic backfire on hunting. And there was a newspaper article that I just read that was like, yeah, look at, I mean. Which is funny because I think Fox News posted something that said uh, PETA's campaign, major backlash, you know, by hunters or whatever. But that was like right after it started. And so it even fooled the news people to, to thinking that, oh, hunters are, hunters are getting back at PETA with this. But I guarantee the PR guy at PETA just was sitting back saying, man, this is money. This is, yeah. this is exact. Cause it, like you said, I, I didn't know that their enrollment increased and fastest growth in how many years. And oh yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a bad deal, but it still has a, still has an impact on us. Yeah. And it's just the lesson to learn from and think before we yeah. act sometimes or use that and show showcase hunting in a good light, yeah. not find the worst picture you can possibly find. 
problem is, is a guy like me goes out and spends two weeks hunting, doesn't kill anything, doesn't come home with anything, and then I'm posting the whole story all along the way. At the same time, you're getting ridiculed because you never kill anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, you're good at taking pictures of sunsets and selfies, guy. You know? Well, yeah. I mean, there, I'm not saying there, – there's a reason that we take photos of right. animals and have skulls around and remember the animal. There's nothing wrong with that. We've got to remember that, that it's our lifestyle. And if we're sharing ourselves on social media, like we're sharing our lifestyle. Exactly. And that includes everything from the hike to the kill to the preparation to everything. So that's, that's something I'm really passionate about is, the, is really pushing home the fact that this is the way we live. You know, this is, is for me, it's a, it's a livelihood. And like I, I don't ever want it to go away. You know, um, it's just part of our lives. Yeah, I agree. I say, good conversation. Just food for thought. Maybe people can comment, and then if anyone listens to this, maybe become an ambassador for hunting and promote it amongst your group of friends because that's how things start. It's grassroots. It's talking to your friends. It's word of mouth. You know, I can't be responsible for all of hunting continuing forever. It's no. every single hunter's responsibility. If you enjoy hunting, take it, like, check look into yourself and say, what am I doing? (laughs) What am I putting out there? And what are my friends doing and putting out there? And then kind of talk about it. Don't, well, I mean, you've got to do something. Even if you've got a hundred followers and you're thinking, ah, it's only my friends that see this. It's not. If if it's a public post, then there's potential for anybody coming across it. Exactly. I did a, um, I can't remember what I was working on. I was working on some editing project and I Googled, um, uh, deer shot by arrow or something like that. Cause I was looking for, a, a basically what I was looking for was a wound. Um, and I, I was blown away by the, the images that popped up. It was page upon page of just scrolling down of live deer with arrows in them, like that had been shot previously or, or whatever, walking around on trail cameras. Most of them, some, some were, were still photos, but it was just this whole huge lit- litany of just crap, you know, that I didn't want to see. And I thought to myself, I'm like, somebody put that out there, you know, to begin with. And uh, thinking maybe it was like, oh, cool, look at this deer. It's just a strong deer because it survived for two weeks with an arrow in it, you know. That's just all ammunition for somebody, Yeah. you know, well, just all bad stuff. And hmm. I can imagine what else you could find on there. Yeah, There's no, PETA has no limited supply. Of content. Correct. Yep. Given to them. Given to them. So. Cool. Thanks, Remy. Yep. Sounds good. We gotta have a story. No, forget the story. Everybody's doing something. We'll do nothing. They say, what's your show about? I say nothing. There you go. It's about nothing. I think you may have something here. <laughs>